Welcome, everybody. It is April 12, uh, 2022. Um, we are at the NRDI meeting, and we welcome the members of the public who are in person and who may be watching our usual video feeds online. I'm happy that we have returned to a hybrid meeting approach. Uh, it is nice to be meeting again in person and to be here with members of the public, my fellow board members, and city staff. Hybrid board meetings allow people to join online through WebEx or in person at the city and county building. Masks are no longer required in city facilities, but are welcome for any attendees who prefer to continue using them. We will continue to monitor the situation and take any reasonable precautions for the public and staff. Thank you, and we're going to move on to our first agenda item. Sorry, what was that? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, we start RDA meetings with comments to the board. Your feedback is always welcomed, and you can share that with the board anytime by mailing the council office at PO Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114-5476, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or by calling our 24-hour phone comment line at 801-535-7654. We are accepting your comments in person and through WebEx. And for those whose only option is to call in, staff will be monitoring a separate telephone line. I want to mention our rules of the quorum. These are guidelines to help our meeting progress in an orderly, civil, efficient way and want to give everyone the opportunity to voice their opinions without feeling intimidated. In order to achieve this, our rules of the quorum begin from the moment you arrive in person or into our virtual meeting. The RDA board respects all points of view and we welcome new insights. Please be respectful, avoid yelling, profanity, or making racial slurs, obscene, or defamatory remarks. If you violate this rule, your line will be muted or you will be asked to stop. If you feel you need to use profanity or disrespectful remarks to express your point, you're welcome to email board members or call our comment line. In addition, our staff will request your name during the WebEx registration process. To limit disruption, your name cannot include a message or violate our rules of the quorum. If your name doesn't meet this requirement, then our staff will make contact with you to gather that information from you. For those joining in WebEx, please monitor your chat in case we try to reach you. Scott Corpani from our staff is helping to moderate the meeting and will be messaging with the attendees to coordinate on any questions with your commenting registration. Staff is handling a number of tasks. Excuse me. Staff is handling a number of tasks. Please limit messages to technical issues and minimal changes to your registration. Taylor Hill on our staff will be calling the names of those who wish to comment. We will call names of people joining on WebEx and in person based on the order of registration or received comment cards. When it, when it is your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name. For people in WebEx, she will unmute your line and you may begin. For people in person, please step up to the podium right there. Uh, and if you have a mask, please feel free to remove before making a comment. Once you begin, please state your name and the two minute timer will start. We will now open our general comment period. Taylor, please start with our first comment. Thank you, Board Chair. It looks like we have two people here for general comment. The first will be Michael Valentine, followed by Casey McDonough. Michael is in person to speak. Sorry. Um, hello. I think most of you guys know me. I'm Michael Valentine. I'm one of the founders of Save the Utah Pantages Theater. I'm also a 2023 candidate for mayor of Salt Lake City of Utah. So I'm here to really talk about two issues today. Um, I'm really not going to get into campaign donations. I think I got plenty of time to talk about that in a mayoral uh, race. Uh, the first issue is I really want to talk about this guy, Director Danny Waltz. I think he needs to be held accountable for his actions as director for the RDA for several years now, um, especially in regards to the Pantages. He uh, inflated restoration costs by $40 million, which aren't accurate. He canceled public surveys, which is actually against an ordinance um, in your own city laws. Um, he canceled updated seismic costs and really worked at every level of this deal to push this to a private developer uh, for a zero dollar deal when this is a, a public building 
um, that was bought with tax dollars to, to be restored. Um, the second thing I'm here to talk about is the community preservation policy in this plan. It was passed in 2012, ironically by um, Aaron Mendenhall's uh, husband, Kyle Lamafa, while he was on city council. This is the number one document in the city about historic preservation. It's 200 pages. It took five years to write this. And, you know, Chris Warren is actually the one who gave it to me, so thank you, Chris. I would ask you to go through and read this. I would ask all of you to read this, and we have copies for you here, um, because this really um, sets the foundation of, of historic policy, especially for city-owned property. There's stuff here about public surveys where the director of the RDA and other city agencies actually have to go out and find historic properties, do public surveys, do public education, um, put the buildings on uh, as landmarks to be protected when they're bought. There's so much stuff in here that's just been completely ignored. This isn't even 10 years old yet. This should be setting the foundation for decades to come for historic preservation. And it's really, you know, unbelievable that um, the city is not even following its own plans. You're ignoring the entire public who wants this save. We have people from around the world watching this right now that want this theater save. Okay. You're ignoring Time. I'll uh, just give this to you guys. Thanks. Follow your own plans. And next will be Casey McDonough, who is also there in person. Hello, everybody. I'm Casey McDonough. Um, and I'm also part of the effort to save the Utah Theater. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more directly about maybe how the RDA operated in the context of that particular deal. Um, it's been a long road that we've traveled to, to find out why the deal happened, um, the circumstances around it. Uh, we were at lots of meetings where questions were asked. Um, and recently we filed a, a legal action to stop the demolition because we believe that there was a purposeful effort to create a narrative that the theater wasn't historic so that certain policies and Utah um, laws didn't have to be followed. The, the plan that Michael mentioned, the uh, um, community preservation plan, I think it's called, um, was adopted into uh, uh, by the city council as an ordinance. So it's not simply a downtown master plan that has no teeth, we believe. Um, more so, the state code has teeth um, because there's certain requirements the city has to follow. Interestingly, all of that may not have saved the theater, but we have ordinances, we have laws, we have rules and regulations because um, thousands of public common hours, um, elected officials of the past adopted them for real reasons because we didn't want certain things to happen, or at least we wanted certain processes to happen. So it's, it's for me as a citizen of the city, it's most alarming because there were such clear indications that, that it was eligible. They were told um, numerous times, but they chose to cherry pick the information that said it wasn't when the majority of the information said it was. And I think that was so they could avoid um, whether it was political fallout or having to follow the ordinances and the laws. Um, so I guess for you guys today, what I'm asking is that you look at um, these ordinances and these, these regulations and laws and make sure that the staff is giving you all the details and that they're following all the regulations and laws because when you don't follow those it makes us feel as citizens um that maybe Time. there's people that have more benefit than we do so thanks thank you and that was the last commenter for general comment all right thank you to everybody who provided general comment uh and i don't see any other comments um commenters Right, we're now at the public hearing portion of our agenda. We only have one public hearing, item B1, resolution, RDA budget amendment number two for fiscal year 2021-22. The same rules of the quorum that I earlier explained also applies to our public hearing portion of the board's agenda. Now, before we begin taking comments, I will first re I will first turn the time over to Ben Lutke, council staff policy analyst, to give a short introduction. Thanks, Madam Chair. The second budget amendment for the RDA includes 53 individual items. The vast majority of them are legally required, whether these are pass-throughs to taxing entities based on interlocal agreement contracts or are reimbursements to property owners that have individual post-performance agreements with the RDA. The discretionary items are outlined in the staff report. 
the board could vote on those today or refer some of them to a later briefing or the annual budget. Thank you, Ben. Taylor, please start with our first public comment. There is no one here for public comment for this item. All right. So, Madam Chair, I think we yeah. need to close the public hearing, so we'll have a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. Well, do I have a motion to close the Madam public Chair, hearing? Madam Chair, move that we close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion by Board Member Mano and second by Board Member Dugan. I'm going to roll call this. Mano? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Uh, Pui? Yes. Dugan? Yes. Petro? Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you. All right. Are we moving on to approval minutes? So the, uh, the board will approve the minutes of Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. And I need a motion. Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. I move that we approve the minute, meeting minutes of Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. Second. Right, I have a, a motion by Board Member Dugan, seconded by Board Member Wharton. <laughs> I'm sure we'll call this Mano. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Pui. Yes. Dugan. Yes. Petro. Yes. And I'm a yes. So those minutes were approved. We're moving to item two, resolution RDA budget amendment number two for fiscal year 2021-22 follow-up. And we have at the table Ben Lutke. Hi, again, and Danny Walls and Aaron Cunningham. Oh, it's all yours. Uh, there was an email sent to the board at 426 yesterday. It has an attachment that compares the estimated tax increment amounts from the original transmittal to the final amounts confirmed by the county. Uh, we can also pull that up on the screen if you wanted to go through the individual items. I just wanted to make sure that you have the information and it was included in the public packet as well. The estimates were fairly accurate. Uh, of the 10 project areas that are generating tax increment, five of them had slight decreases and the other five had slight increases. All of these were just a few percentage points from what was estimated. Right. The revised transmittal, it also has four items that were not included in the original transmittal. And all of those were discussed at the last briefing, but I'm gonna run through them real quick uh, as a reminder. The first is in West Temple Gateway. It's $40,000 for construction mitigation assistance to businesses in the Central Ninth area. And this would be the second round of assistance related to the construction. And it's proposed because the construction is uh, being delayed. It's taking longer than the original schedule. And those delays are related to timelines with Rocky Mountain Power and other utilities for undergrounding their various cables and conduit. So it's not something we can speed up without the utilities being ready as well. The next three items are all in block 70. Uh, one is revenue and two are expenditures for that new revenue. There was a cash bond posted, maybe it was a decade ago, it was several years ago, uh, and engineering has released that bond and it was related to the Eccles Theater uh, construction of the street, the public right of way in front of the theater. It's $720,000 of revenue that is now available for use and the, the proposed uses are twofold. First is $100,000 for relocation of the Bennion Jewelers. Uh, there is an agreement between them and the RDA from when the Eccles Theater was originally negotiated with adjacent property owners. The second item is $620,000 for potential future improvements and maintenance at the Eccles Theater, the McCarthy Plaza, and or Regent Street. Now that funding would go into a holding account pending determination of what specific improvements or maintenance would be done. So this will come back to you for specific approval and a future budget opening. One other change of note the housing trust fund, it was originally listed as $2 million. And this is transferring that funding from the hand division to the RDA. This is part of the board and council's policy direction for a one-stop shop 
for all affordable housing development. It's been increased. It went from 2 million to 2.8 million. Next week in budget amendment number seven, you will also see a corresponding item on the general fund side. So we have to have uh, two items, one on the general fund side to send it to the RDA and this one in front of you today to receive it from the general fund. Great. The RDA is requesting the board approve the items in the budget amendment today. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one option is you could approve the legally required items, which are most of them in the budget amendment, if you want more time on some of the discretionary items, or if you wanted to consider them in context of the annual budget. Uh, it is entirely up to the board which items to approve today. And um, Ben, I, I'm not finding the staff report in the online packets. It was probably just a mistake. Oh. So I don't know if Taylor has access to it and can pull it up on the screen. I'm just thinking if um, board members can't access the motions, then <laughs> maybe, I don't know if you can walk through them on the fly, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. The, the simplest would be if the board wanted to approve all the items, it would be I move the board approve the budget amendment as proposed by the administration. Uh, an alternative is you move to approve the legally required items, and then all the discretionary items would be dealt with at a future meeting. All right, board members, you have a preference. Um, go ahead. Madam board Chair, member. just been some clarification on the bond. This is a bond that the agency put up cash for potential non-performance on that, but that's now being released by the city. So it's from the agency the city was holding it, now the city's giving it back to the agency and we can now use it for other things as an agency. Is that, Correct. am I understanding that correctly? Correct. And then the two things are Benyon Jewelers helping them move mm -hmm. and then updates to McCarthy Plaza and Regent Street and a few other things. Yep, and the latter one goes into a holding account pending specific identification of what those improvements would be at those locations. And the Benyon Jewelers, was that something that we are already have agreed to them to do or what's the sort of policy rationale behind? Yeah, helping? there was an agreement. Okay, I, I don't know the, the history of that. Um, that. That was before my time. I don't know if Jen I, knows more. <laughs> Uh, maybe the simplest thing to say is that we, we helped them move to accommodate the location of the Eccles Theater. Exactly. That boiled down a big, long history in one sentence. But they still proud. need help. <laughs> they still need help moving more things or? This is just the, the final payment of that reimbursement. The okay, it, got it. it. Thanks. It was tied to them renewing a five-year lease. So we paid the, with the first lease, paid again if they stayed at the five-year mark. That's where we're at. But the previous board has already agreed to this, and now we're just finalizing what was agreed to previously. Thanks. That's helpful. All right. Any other comments or preferences about um, making a decision on this amendment? Concerns? No? So should we? OK, so then I need a motion, correct, by someone, um, whichever, whichever option you'd like. But I think it will be my preference that we approve it all together. But um, that's up to the board. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the budget amendment as proposed. Great. Second. Second. Ooh. <laughs> so uh, we have a motion by Board Member Mano and a second by Board Member Petro. Um, I'm going to roll call this. Board Member Mano? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Pui? Yes. Dugan? Yes. Petro? Yes. Is Amy Fowler? Online. She was planning to join remotely. I don't see her in the meeting yet, but um, I'll send her a message and see if she, that's still the plan. Okay. So, and I'm a yes, so um, that moves forward without board member Fowler being present yet. All right. We're moving on to item number three. It's informational uh, about North Temple Strategic Interven Intervention Fund. And at the table, we still have Ben, Danny, and Carrot Linsley. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. You have a presentation? Yeah. Happy. So it would be Taylor who will bring it up? Great. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, I'm just going to follow along on my screen. Um, okay. If we could go to the next slide. I um, just wanted to provide a little background on this topic. Um, last 
year when the board was approving the RDA budget for fiscal year 22, um, the board consolidated $4 million of funds from three different sources to provide funding for North Temple Strategic Intervention Fund. Um, so that, fun that budget item is in place. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, proposing the expansion of the use of that fund. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, since that budget appropriation, the RDA has brought to you the North Temple Project Area Implementation Plan. Um, we brought that a few months back and um, I just wanted to call out the objectives that were identified in that plan. Um, and as a reminder, that plan is used administratively to help guide the prioritization of RDA projects and um, the funding requests that we bring to you each year. Um, so the objectives that we identified in that plan were to facilitate sustainable and equitable transit-oriented development in the North Temple area, um, support rental and ownership products for an income diverse neighborhood, extend the City Creek Corridor to Jordan River, facilitate strategic interventions and improve environmental conditions. And also since the budget appropriation, if we could go to the next slide, Taylor. Um, we shared with you the RDA's equitable and inclusive development work plan and I just wanted to call out a few of the objectives that were identified there um, that focus on um, preventing the displacement of residents and business owners um, in our project areas, uh, creating opportunities to build wealth through home and commercial ownership, um, providing opportunities for the community to identify the services and amenities that are desired in their own communities, and ensuring the equitable distribution of environmental benefits in our project areas and protecting neighborhood character. So we used those two um, plans to guide the development of the goals we would like to propose for the North Temple Strategic Intervention Fund. Um, and those goals are on the next slide, if we could go to that, Taylor. Um, to preserve small scale building fabric in which small local businesses can thrive and ensure that new developments are an asset to the neighborhoods that surround them. Um, to achieve these two goals, we're proposing three activities to use the strategic intervention funds for. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, I can talk about the first one, which is property acquisition. Um, so uh, the RDA is proposing to use funds for property acquisition in an effort to preserve the existing small scale building fabric of the community and prevent the displacement of the city's local independent businesses. Um, small businesses often need small scale commercial space. Um, it's often left out of new developments in favor of larger space that's suitable for larger tenants, often national chains. Um, and also in newly developed spaces, um, we typically see much higher lease rates than the spaces with the older buildings. So we think through property ownership, the RDA could address both of these issues by adaptively reusing the existing building stock and providing affordable commercial spaces. And the second um, activity we're proposing is, um, to um, provide funding for site development costs. Um, we're aware of environmental contamination along the Folsom Corridor and North Temple Project area in general, um, resulting from historical and uh, railroad uses in the past. Um, and in cases where the RDA is a project owner, we are eligible for EPA br uh, Brownfields cleanup grants that are up to $650,000 to address site contamination. Um, these brownfield cleanup grants require 20% match and property owners, private property owners are not eligible for them. So by the RDA owning property, um, it opens up this tool for the RDA to clean up environmental contamination on these sites. And then in addition to um, funding environmental assessments and cleanup, these funds could be used to address other site and utility issues that are barriers to redevelopment. And then last, if we could advance. 
Um, the third activity uh, we're proposing to use these funds for is to provide development support for community benefits. So I think we probably all understand that the North Temple Corridor is rapidly developing. Um, in this scenario, the RDA could intervene in privately initiated developments to ensure the inclusion of public benefits in these developments that are a priority for us in this project area. Um, so as an example, we could facilitate the inclusion of affordable commercial space um, so that ground floor space can be activated with neighborhood businesses and amenities. Um, we could uh, facilitate the inclusion of a diverse housing type um, so that we could provide family-sized housing units in these developments. And then also encourage um, development along the Folsom Trail to be oriented toward the trail um, for uh, the recently developed it, or recently completed Folsom Trail in the corridor there. So that um, is, those are the three activities we are proposing for the fund. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think our understanding is that um, because this is a budget appropriation already in place, that if the board agrees with the uh, recommendation we're making, that you could approve through a straw poll the expansion of the use of these funds for these activities. Thanks, Kara. Um, thank you. That's great. I have a question. This new ideas, would that override the original idea of maybe using some funds for acquisition, or is that still on the table? I think it would just expand it's just the expand. uses the board okay. has. Just, All right. just so to clarify something... that these new uses could also be pursued. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. To go along with that, do we have any idea? It, it feels from an outsider looking in like everything is claimed on North Temple. Do we have any idea what so, how many properties are acquirable? <laughs> <laughs> Even if they are technically for sale, I feel like the prices are ridiculous. Um, I think we have seen some properties for sale on the market. Um, we've inquired about others, so I think there are properties in the North Temple project area. Because I mean, I would I would love for you all to take as many as possible, but it's, <laughs> it it feels like you know you're getting to like those latter rounds of the board game of Monopoly, and you know it's getting tough. <laughs> so my question is like this: these are great ideas, and I think this is what we want to do. It just looks like. It, to me, it, you know, we tried something like this in the past, and it does take a lot of work to get to convince people that there is some money available. So one question is, are, is this going to be grant or loans? So do people have to go through our process? That's one question. And the second question is, are we going to have somebody specific um, or staff specific um, leading this effort to figure out how many small businesses we still have in the area, um, things that may be coming online. I know, uh, I think the, um, the right aid was acquired, maybe. I heard from some constituents that that was acquired, it was going to change. So we, is somebody going to go talk to those developers to say, hey, this is what we're planning, um, take us up on it, we need X, Y, and C. I mean, it, it seems like it's a, it's a lot of work. I just wanna make sure that we actually it gets done. It, I worked on North Temple way back. You have it listed here. And I was able to do a few of the facade improvements on North Temple, but it wasn't as successful as I thought it would be. It, there was a lot of um, maybe some government resistance or, or some you know skepticism um, to get through the process. And unfortunately, we, I think I was only able to do five or six facade improvements. So again, and it was you know one person one staff dedicated to this so I want to make sure that we can make it happen so two questions I guess just two. um so I guess because there are three activities here that were proposed um, and I think your questions are mostly directed at the third one which is um, development support for community benefits because with property acquisition um, that is something that we dedicate staff to and um, have time that we spend on that and on um, developing RFPs and, and properties once we acquire property. Um, so I'll focus on the third one. Um, I, I agree that, that um, this will take a significant marketing effort and make sure that people know about it. Um, but these activities are part of 
what we hope to develop as a commercial loan program or a commercial assistance program that we plan to come back to the board in a couple of months to talk to you about. Um, but that program will have dedicated staff to it and will also involve a lot of community engagement to make sure people know what we are proposing and also to get feedback on how to make it successful. So, great, thank you. Go ahead, Dugan. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation here. That the four million you could probably spend on each of those three priorities. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple times. Uh, so, how are you? How you? How do you envision yourself using that funding? I know you're not going to peanut butter spread it, but I mean, you got to balance it around. So, how do you propose that you're uh, going to use the funding and not leave out one for another one and prioritize them themselves? That's the million dollar question. I think as, as you indicated, obviously we're aware of properties that are on the market right now that we could probably spend not just this four million, but more. Um, but I think our focus would be a combination of one, looking at the area that we want to target. And, and as Kara indicated, I think that starts along Folsom. Um, and then I think the next step is looking at what the greatest need is um, and why, what can we do to help kind of spur development in the way that we would like to see. Um, so to that extent, I think we'd first look at how we can work and leverage our funds with existing property owners and other programs. And then to the extent that as part of that analysis, we discover properties that maybe need a little bit more help, we could then step it up to whether that becomes more of a site development cost participation. And then if that doesn't succeed or other properties come up, then those would be ones we'd look at maybe just buying outright. But I think we'd focus first on trying to get the biggest bang out of our buck and how to stretch that dollar by utilizing other programs first. And then the last resort is then falling back on whether we just need to, to identify a few, pro few properties and pick them up ourselves. So I don't think we have that list right now. I certainly don't think we have that plan because part of this we need to do a few other things to put in place like the commercial loan program, look at some of the properties and then specifically reach out to property owners to see even what the interest and the needs are. So I think as we look at all of those things and come back, hopefully the priorities will start identifying themselves as part of that process. And just to add, um, just for board members' context, um, to the extent that, you know, in, in um, proceeding on this program, you identify that, you know, the need is five or six million dollars. Um, in the annual budget or budget amendments, the board can always adjust the amount dedicated to this program, right? There, it might mean shifting funds away from other programs, but um, that is within the board's purview to add or redirect funding into this program. So that's an option too. just to keep in mind. And, and to build on that, because I think, Jen, that's a great point. We could also comp uh, combine our funding too, not just reallocate, but whether we identify a site that we think could become a housing site, then obviously we can stack that with some of our housing funds. So just, I, I think that's a very great point. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. So I, I mean, I agree with a lot of the comments. I think they're all good ideas. I'm not sure if I have one that I feel like is more important than the others, but the one I do have questions on, and it sounds like we'll have a, a, talk, a discussion in a future board meeting, but the a commercial loan program, I wouldn't want to, um, I want to be really clear about what the RDA's commercial loan program is as opposed to like economic developments, um, business loan programs, and how are they similar or different, and is it, do we inadvertently create the same situation we had with HAND and RDA where there were substantially similar loan programs happening at different parts of the, the bigger you know, city? So um, I guess that'll be my question when we get to that discussion is like, is it just development of buildings for commercial purposes? I thought we already did that to a certain degree and how is that different than what the RDA's are already, already doing? And if it is duplicative, then let's be really careful not to create the same problem that we had before. No, no question, gonna, but just a thought. <laughs> and I'm going to add to that. I think in the past, in my experience, what was difficult for some of them is because we had, and I think we've evolved, and I think we have better, like, uh, um, what you call it, like, um, applications, and they're easier mm -hmm. to understand now, but maybe also looking into that when we're trying to loan some funds to people that might not be accustomed to it or have not done that before. So 
some people, you know, get scared. I got scared when I had to do my first loan. Like, I, it was too complicated in my head. I had a husband that helped me. <laughs> Thank you, Regan, if he's listening. Like, uh, held my hand, uh, you know, to do this. But it could be really overwhelming to small business owner to go through uh, a process, you know, with the city. So uh, that's something that I wish we have that in mind. Another one more thing, and, and, and another thing that I was thinking about, May, and it's for the future as well, but maybe as that international market happens and grows and becomes, hopefully that becomes an incubator as well for North Temple. So that's when we intervene with RDA commercial loans or um, facilitation of certain things so that those folks, instead of when they're growing and they're doing really well, instead of moving on to other cities, they could stay in the area and they could live and, you know, live, work and play where they live close by. So that's another way to, to distribute these funds in my, in my opinion. Go ahead, Victoria. I also want to say I really appreciate the focus on the Folsom Corridor because North Temple is becoming kind of frenetic and a little bit it, it's it's a very daunting landscape, but I do love this concept of the, the Fisher Mansion to the international market. And then we know in the next decade to two, we've got the, the Rocky Mountain property potentially coming online. I do love us establishing a presence and kind of a standard for what we expect with that Folsom Corridor uh, eventually terminating in that area. And I really do love that we would take that opportunity and, and maybe f focus there where the the stakes are marginally lower, but we have a chance to make more of an impact with them. Madam Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm not on the camera, but thank you for letting, I mean, plus the silver lining to COVID is this, um, that I get to be here. But one of um, the things I have been thinking about and listening to this and when I reviewed the material and is just the policy discussion on the that we've had with our housing, which is the um, the sort of one stop shop idea, right? And I don't know that we need to make that happen here as a one stop shop, right? But I want to make sure that we're not um, not reinventing the wheel, but that we're not overlapping. To your point. Um, Chair, Chair Boyman Valdemoros is like that we're not overlapping and we're not creating the same problems, but more that we're making sure the money is getting spent further. And so that like somebody could go to the EDLF and get a loan and then go to the RDA and get a loan, which is fine and great if that's what is need be, but like how are we tracking that and how are we making sure that there's not like double dipping. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, it does make sense. Thanks. I thought you were going to say RDA needs to do all of the <laughs> economic. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no, they're doing the housing, <laughs> the whole lot of stuff. But no, it makes sense. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. Uh, no, no, um, no, it makes sense. And that makes sense. That was more, more Mano's comment. And the, my comment was more about making it easier and more um, approachable, uh, you know, when we when people apply for these loans, so that it's not overwhelming and that people just give up and don't do it. And then we have the money sitting there. And I think, Madam Chair, I think Go those ahead. comments are actually super linked to each other, because if we have two separate processes, that are both kind of complicated for maybe a newer small small business owner or someone where English is not their first language, then it's even more going to concentrate the the disbursement of those funds in an inequitable way. Uh, whereas if it was a one stop shop, th then at least it's only one application that a business owner has to deal with as opposed to two separate ones. So I think those actually are inherently linked, making sure that our processes are as clear and as simple as possible, both just so that we're not duplicating things and we're being efficient with staff time, but so that the public has, as many people of the public have access to that as possible. And if we have language access programs or things, we don't need to make twice as many of them because we have the same loans in different departments. Right, thank you. All right, any other comments on this item? Okay, uh, Yeah, then. Madam Chair, I think if, if it uh, 
it's meanwhile to the board, we'd really appreciate a, a strong poll vote. Right. Again, just the purpose of this is to get direction and permission from you that we can utilize and look at these opportunities to start looking at the funds. Obviously, those would come back to the board, and we really appreciate the comments and conversation with regard to the commercial loan program. It gives us a good little preview of what we're working on, and we can start incorporating that right away. And Kara, I didn't know if you had anything else to add on top of that. Um, I guess I just wanted to mention um, that we are working closely with economic development and okay. um, want to make sure that what we establish really complements their programs and provide materials that will really facilitate the process for people who come to the city and are looking for commercial um, assistance. So that's great. So we'll continue to work together, and those are great. Those are great comments. Thank you, I, Go ahead, I, Madam Chair. Yeah, I have. A, I guess all of this. I was just thinking uh, the environmental mi mitigation funds uh, that you know this uh, this expansion of uh, of services allow so it's, you said that it wasn't for privates to use so privates couldn't access this these funds is that correct private property owners can access a lot of brownfields funds but this is a specific cleanup grant um, that's up to $650,000 that municipalities and RDAs and specific entities can access. $650,000 in total or uh, for a site. For a site. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and so it, so the goal there is that some properties that will not otherwise be sold because it's a lot of work to clean them up, we have an extra tool to say well, you know, now we have all this money, we can buy it or we can help you with these funds so you can put it on the market. Is that the, the objective there? Um, yes, or we could acquire the property and um, apply for the funds and clean the site up and then either put it out for sale or hold on to it and um, ground lease it, something like that. And how, is that, how do you determine how, which property has needs mitigation or environmental work? I know. I know, Kara. Just, <laughs> Tell me. This is what happens. Is it a game you show? have to hire an environmental company that comes to your property and tests the ground. So there's like a first phase where they do a historic um, look of the titles and see what uses there were in the past. And then they tell you, we think that maybe because there was X business or use there, it might be contaminated. And that takes a second round where they go test the ground. And those, those, um, those uh, costs are between ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and then or more. And then if they find that it was, it's actually contaminated, then you have to do a cleanup because no bank or a new owner, you know, will buy it without the property being clean. So I think that's how the RDA. If it was dirt, if, if it's unclean, if they need, then the RDA would step in, right, and then clean up the area or buy the property. That's right, and the process you described is exactly right. In the RDA in Salt Lake City, um, got an EPA Brownfields grant for North Temple back in 2012, 2013, um, to assess sites. And so there have been some site assessments that have been done in the area that we already have data oh, cool. about. I was just wondering about this, if there is a way of using that as a carrot, I guess, for, and I guess this is all the purpose of this, right? But uh, maybe you'd reach out and, you know, go knock some doors and find through the titles who owns them and said, hey, you know, you know, you have an opportunity here. And um, I, th that area, uh, you know, with the trains and all this industrial work that was done there for probably 100 years, I'm sure that, you know, these funds could be very beneficial. So thank you for this, uh, helping me understand this. It's, a, it's an awesome opportunity, trust me. <laughs> Whoever is listening, here's some money to clean up your property if it's dirty. Anyway, so if you, if you don't have any other comments, we're going to move on. Uh, Ooh, sorry, it's Tropo. I keep forgetting. <laughs> sorry, Danny. I had it here. I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Tropo. So how do we straw pull the third item, given that we still have some policy questions about it? Do we just say... How does that affect what we straw poll right now? You're, okay. I hope I'm going to say what you're going to say, Jen. Uh, I think you're, you're not authorizing the use of the funds. Really all this is is expanding the potential uses of the funds that are in a holding account. This will come back to you. So whether that's when the commercial loan program comes back to you or whether it's specific projects that we bring back to you either for acquisition or loan or participation, 
we, we won't be able to do anything except start just looking at projects within this scope and everything will come back to you. So we're just saying in general, yes, staff follow these three ideas, but bring us back more information when you're actually ready to implement it. Okay. And, and just practically speaking, every annual budget discussion is kind of a check-in at, you know, on each of these things because that's when you guys ask your policy questions about, you know, how are we using these funds? Is it the best way to use these funds? Do we want to move funds around? So I think that's another opportunity to kind of fine-tune your expectations on these dollars a little bit more too. Well, in that case, I'm, I'm happy to propose a straw poll that we support these three ideas as presented. Great. So show your feelings. <laughs> All right. Amy, I know you're showing your feelings. I can, I can feel it. <laughs> you're right, Madam Chair. I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're good there. Yes. Um, thank we're you, moving Chair, on. Thank you. thank you so much. We're moving on to item number four. I want to say to um, Council Chair Dugan that we're doing really good on time. So <laughs> just yeah, I would like I would like some <laughs> acknowledgement of that. <laughs> it feels better than the Council generally. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, we're on uh, item number four, resolution, um, affordable housing funding priorities for fiscal year 2022-23. And we're receiving a briefing uh, about this and about and consider resolution that would adopt the affordable housing funding priorities. And at the table, we have Alison Rowland, Danny Walls, Tracy Tran, and Lauren Parisi. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as a brief introduction, this is a follow-up to the proposed fiscal year 2023 housing development funding strategy that you began to hear about in March, and it's part of a relatively new process that the RDA board is following um, through the budget, um, through the annual adoption process. To clarify, the board, appro that board approval is needed for both the amount of the annual RDA revenue that's allocated to the housing funds, and it's also needed for the specific funding allocations among housing activities, for example, emergency gap financing, loans, property acquisition, et cetera. Um, the RDA can also make any policy changes among housing activities or budget allocations at any time during the year. It can review and consider each specific loan project, actually it will review and consider each specific loan project proposal before any, any specific funding is approved, and it can suspend any adopted policies under special circumstances for a specific project proposal. So those are just some things to keep in mind as these two explain all the rest to you. Yeah, thank you, Allison. So I'll try to keep it brief today. Um, the housing development loan program policy, again, requires that you approve housing funding priorities on an annual basis. And this is what we discussed at your uh, March meeting. And those priorities include affordable home ownership, family housing, deeply affordable housing, and missing middle housing. Um, and so a resolution with these priorities has been brought for your consideration today. Um, the resolution also notes that family housing and, and or deeply affordable housing will be made as thresholds for this year's housing development um, loan program applications in order to qualify. So that is what is up for your consideration today and we can take any questions you may have. Or members, do you have any questions about this? I don't see it. I, I appreciate the, uh, yeah. this is, I like the policies, of course, because we're the ones who've adopted and liked it. So <laughs> I'm patting ourselves on the back here, but uh, I appreciate the uh, briefing here and especially on, you know, as we continue to talk, family housing and deeply affordable are so, so vitally important to the city. And, uh, if we get that right and we get that moving, a lot of things will fall into place. And so I appreciate the uh, focus on those two and making sure that we uh, do it right. I do have a question. This is just for uh, education-wise and maybe a little off track. Primary housing and secondary housing funds. Explain the primary and explain the difference. That's a good question. So the primary housing collects the 
funds that are required to be allocated to housing by state statute 17C. So within each project area, there's a certain amount of funds that need to be allocated to housing, and that's what the primary housing fund collects. And then the secondary housing is kind of what we allocate in addition to those ma the mandated funds. Is that right? Did I get that right? Goes above and beyond what's statutorily required. The secondary. Yeah. Secondary, yeah. So essentially, there there are four buckets that the RDA uses to collect the funds from different sources, and then separately, there's the allocation or the um, decision, the board's decision on priorities on how to spend them. So that's so there's sort of two levels to this. If that's helpful. And is. Is it true, Madam Chair, that there are different statutory regulations on each of those funds as well? What they can be spent for and where? Yeah. Like some have more, more restrictions than others? Correct. And that's kind of like noted in the uh, funding policy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also just want to say I agree with Council or Board Member Dugan about um, the importance of family housing and deeply affordable housing because I think those are the things we're not seeing come from the private market. Um, I think for a long time we weren't seeing, you know, we've been spending taxpayer dollars to fund kind of all levels of affordability. And I, I really, I'm hopeful that uh, with our council hats, with the affordable housing incentives program, we can really get those moderately affordable housing units without having to spend money on them. And we need to start directing those to deeply affordable housing and or family housing, which are just so much more expensive for the private market to create. Whereas 60 to 80% AMI units are still profitable, I think, to, or can be still profitable um, under with private funding. So I think getting um, th th those two things are incredibly important to me. And, and I'm glad that we are as a RDA board identifying those as needs because I think those are the things that are needed that the private market's not going to be able to fill. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Board Member Mano. I think that's, this is the beauty of the tools that the city has to try to help with a problem, a social problem that we have right now. I'm grateful for the administration as well for being on board and, and doing this and putting it you know, in, in paper and hopefully in action soon um, with all the issues that we have with housing right now. So um, I'm proud of you guys for putting this together and for listening to us. Thank you. Um, um, I don't have any other comments on this. Jen? Um, I, maybe clarification from RDA staff is the hope that we, uh, the board would adopt this resolution today so that staff has the um, necessary direction as the staff is putting together the annual budget. Is that right? Correct. That's right. <laughs> okay. So a motion to adopt the resolution okay, so will be on the table. If we have no other comments, we need a motion to adopt this. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the resolution on the affordable housing funding priorities for fiscal year 22 to 23. Second. I have a motion by Board Member Dugan, seconded by Board Member Pui. I'm going to roll call. Petro? Yes. Dugan? Yes. Pui? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Mano. Yes. And I'm oh, and Fowler. Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Fowler has a comment. Oh, sorry, Amy, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, I. It's all good. Never mind. I'll just be a yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and I'm a yes then. So that passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are on item number five, report and announcements. Yeah. <laughs> See? Whatever whatever you want, Dan. <laughs> you told me you told me to be on time. <laughs> Here we are. Report and announcements from the executive director. Maybe the mayor or maybe Rachel. <laughs> no? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and now on item number six, report and announcements from RDA staff. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We just have one quick uh, report that I think was a last minute addition. Uh, we want to embarrass, I mean, announce the hiring of Austin Taylor, who is our most recent project manager. 
Uh, Austin came to us from Park City where he was a transportation planner. The irony there is he lives within a five minute bike ride from work now so he no longer has to commute as a transportation planner. Uh, so that's great. Uh, prior to that he was with uh, Planning Department of Provo City and the Director of Development for Bicycle Collective in Provo as well. So he is currently finishing up his master's degree in real estate development at the University of Utah. Go Utes. Uh, and we're happy to have him on board. So. All right, welcome. This is exciting. <laughs> that is all we have, unless you have questions. And otherwise, thank you, uh, board, very much. Oh, what, any questions, comments? No? Nope. All right, thank you, Danny. Uh, we have no written briefings. And we have our item number E set date, resolution budget for the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake City, fiscal year 2223. So we're. A motion to a motion to adopt the consent. Move for approval. Second. Right. Um, motion by Board Member Wharton, seconded by Mano. I'm going to roll call this. Petro. Yes. Dugan. Yes. Pui. Yes. Fowler. Tricky. Right. Yes. <laughs> Wharton. Yes. Mano. Yes. And I'm a yes. Um, so that passes. And then. Uh, we have a closed session scheduled for strategy to discuss the purchase, exchange, or lease of real property and attorney client matters. So I need a motion for that. Madam Chair, I move that we go into closed session for the purpose of discussing, discussing property acquisition and uh, receiving advice of counsel. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion by Board Member Wharton, seconded by Dugan. I'm going to roll call. Petro. Yes. Dugan. Yes. Pui. Yes. Fowler. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Mano. Yes. And I'm a yes. And for the purposes of the recorder, um, we will not be, uh, at the conclusion of your closed session, we will be con uh, convening uh, you guys will be convening as the city council meeting for the city council work session. We're concluded with the RDA work session as of now. Thank you so much for that. Anyway, whoever needs to stay in this room, please stay. And whoever doesn't, uh, we invite you to leave. And then politely. council member Fowler, it'll just be a few minutes while we get set up. All right. For thank you.